What is happening guys? Got a big video for you. We're going from the stage where the Ducati Monster conversion left off with the completion of the battery. From that point all the way to driving, programming, balancing, getting it all working. So there's a lot to happen in between. This video is going to cover all of that. It goes in tandem with the video that the Inja posted. Mine will be kind of more voiceovers, descriptions of what's going on, thought processes, why, obviously all the things I normally cover. That's what we're diving into. So stay tuned for the whole ride. Obviously, you'll know I put timestamps down in the description so you know where certain sections are. But land it off with a whole overview at the end where anything that I feel like I might have missed while going through the videos and the time lapse with the voiceovers. So any questions you got, drop them in the comments as always. I will answer them. I will clarify what I can, give you more behind the scenes info as needed. Uh, but I hope this is helpful to each of you and that you are enjoying the product and that you get into the giveaway more details on the Ingest channel, of course. Take you guys along for the ride, and I will catch you at the end. So we're starting off by cutting out some aluminum sheets. This is 6061 alloy, and it is an eighth of an inch thick. This is going to be the box that the battery is housed in. If you missed the build of that battery, feel free to check out either the video on my channel or the Ingest channel. Go into a lot more detail in both of those. Uh, it was designed intentionally to be quite form-fitting, and so as a result, I'm cutting it not much larger than the dimension of the battery. And this is my first attempt at doing TIG welding. I'm just tacking up each of the edges real quick and making sure it's square. I do have to actually disassemble it a couple of times from the tacked position to make sure everything fit well. Um, and so it was a bit of a learning process all in all. The most difficult part for me was getting the settings dialed in um, and I moved from being completely terrible at TIG welding to almost proficient, I would say, um, to the point where I can make a, a bead that penetrates well and is not terribly ugly. Um, a lot of what I did is not shown on camera. I did obviously have to do long beads and I did not capture all of them, so part of what was my better work was not quite captured in film. And this was actually the part of the box I had to disassemble because I did not tack it frequently enough and the extra conductive potential of aluminum allowed the heat to travel more and warping happened quite badly. All right, guys, full update. Um, I So far, I got this box fully welded up. I got the corners all done, and then I ground off on each edge. You can see it has good penetration. Uh, each of the corners is showing full depth the full way through, and when I ground it down, there were no sections that had me in any way thinking there wasn't good penetration. It's welded on um, all but one of the sides, so I guess five sides are welded. The top is going to be this plate here. On top of it, we're gonna have all of the electronic hardware, controller, DC to DC converter, which I'm actually getting another one. The one that I ordered, I did not realize was, I switched over to a higher current, and all of a sudden the voltage capabilities of the input dropped down to 72 volts or less. So I got two that are coming in that are 180 watts each. I'll just have one on the headlights and one on everything else. It's kind of the way that I'm gonna set this up. So I'm gonna have two of those. This isn't being used anymore. But those will go here, um, have the contactor and the shunt. Um, those will go up on the front because this goes on the negative battery and then the contactor goes on the positive off the battery. So those will be up in the front here. The battery wire is going to come up. I'm going to just cut a little slot out here so this can slide onto the battery. There's not enough room on the plate for everything I'm going to put on it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm obviously going to have to have mounting tabs that can go down across the battery and then be able to be attached to the battery. So I'm going to have studs that I'm going to weld on to this. And those drop over the top, screw it down. Um, but I'm going to have those also be coming up with a platform in front and in back of the controller so that I can mount things on top of it. The contactor and the shunt can both go on top of the front one, uh, the back one. I'm guessing at some point I'm gonna have additional things that I need to do. I'll probably have manifolds where the DC to DC converter wires come up and mount down. I'm gonna just be able to have extra things up there. This though, can't have anything on top of it because it has to be able to drop down onto the studs. If there's something across the top, I wouldn't be able to set it down on top of it. Uh, so that's the one thing that needs to be nothing on top of. What will be above that though, obviously the tank sits on top of that. I put a plate in there, which uh, Nick went ahead and bondoed, and then this is just like the enamel coating on top of that. We're gonna sand it down so that there's just, you know, a smooth lip there. But I'm gonna have a current and voltage meter 
as well as a battery temperature gauge there. The temperature gauge will just drop down the discharge leads through the fiberglass into the pack of the array of cells. I'm gonna have those attached on disconnects so you can pull the tank up, unplug like three little connectors so that you can easily pull it off and then you know, you could also pull this off separately. So everything's kind of modular where you can just pull things off. So I'm gonna have these on there. I also bought in case I wanted to not have things be able to be plugged in to the wrong plugs. I bought other ones that were, you know, two, three, four, five different pins each. They do require that you build them, you know, insert the pins and then, you know, put the little, uh, those red things in there, or basically hold the pins in the correct location. A little bit of a painstaking process. I would prefer just using these two pins. It's gonna be Anderson plugs to the battery to the controller. And then obviously just phase wires going in there. One thing that I do need to modify, and this is interesting, is um, the attachment for this seat, which this isn't really doing a whole lot for the structure aside from being something that the seat mounts to. The battery box, which I knew would be cutting it super close, actually touches here and it's about a quarter of an inch too wide to slide down or to slide past this. So I'm gonna snip this, cut through here, cut a notch out, bend it outward a little bit, and then just jog it back over. The tank runs up across the top of it and it's actually wider than it, and then the seat doesn't come down all the way to it. So we actually have nothing that says this can't be brought out just a little bit. So my goal will be to make it so that that battery box slides right down. We're also gonna reinforce everywhere possible. I'm gonna run um, you know, bracing that goes across. I'm gonna run bracing that goes across. Obviously the bottom's gonna be braced by welding that bracket on, but I'll be able to do a similar you know, angle pieces here from that attachment point. I'm in the Electric Motorcycles Builders group on Facebook, and they were mentioning concern point here. That I'm not worried about. That I will show you how that's gonna work. The back, we've got a plan for mounting up the hub motor, but for now, I'm gonna start brackets for mounting the lid and also the little uh, second layer of a mounting points there. I'll jump on that and I'll take you guys along. I started off by finding the correct placement for the controller and then cutting out two little rectangular sections for that second level platform. They were the same width as the case below, but they were specifically different lengths depending on what I needed to mount to them and the height depended on the height of the wires coming out of the controller. So I had to play with it a little bit, had to get some guesses, trial and error, and eventually landed on the right heights and placements. I also attached some flanges facing downward towards the battery case itself, which are intended as attachment points to hold the lid onto the case, as well as kind of keeping the shape of the battery case intact once you have it, the battery shoved into it, which I know it's a tight fit, so that was really intended to keep it in a rectangular shape by forcing it inward. Here I started attaching the platforms to the posts that had them elevated to the right heights and also started kind of adjusting and messing with the locations for each of the components that would sit on them. Uh, it was a little bit of trial and error to find the right spot for the shunt and for the contactor to figure out best ways to keep those wires isolated from each other so nothing would short circuit as well as just making it all fit underneath the tank lid as well. So I just cut out and here I am now attaching threaded rod as studs for the controller to mount onto. And one of the things I was facing with this battery case is it's so precisely the same height as the battery that anything that goes into or through the lid of that case has to be flush on the back side. 
So here I'm actually using a sheet of quarter inch thick ABS plastic as a way to electrically isolate my shunt. Obviously shunts are usually just a copper or brass or some sort of a metal that is supposed to be screwed directly to a platform and that platform cannot conduct electricity so I actually used those layers to separate out studs that allowed me to mount it downward and then mount the shunt upward without having it be able to conduct electricity through the platform it was sitting on. And then here I am mapping the placement and working to attach the DC to DC converters. I drilled holes through and then countersunk it with a, an angled head screw so that it was able to be flush on the back side once it was inserted. So here I am once again using that 3 8 inch threaded rod as studs for mounting the nuts onto for attaching the lid to the box. Same method as before, just drill a hole, weld it from the back side and grind it flat. And here I am cutting those notches and widening out that opening for the battery case and kind of test fitting everything as I go to make sure it all works correctly. And here we are finally going over that swing arm attachment point. I ended up getting a one inch internal diameter tubing that had a quarter inch thick walls and had a guy from a machine shop bore that out to 26 millimeters so it fit my bearings correctly. I'm using a template from the original crankcase, found out the right spacing, right width, and made that all fit correctly. Here I'm just measuring, placing, and cutting each of the holes for the volt and amp meter as well as the battery temperature sensor. And then starting to get into some of the wiring for the disconnect cables on that, which I ended up just using the two pins that were pre-made and soldering those wires on. Thought process being, even if you switched them, it wouldn't cause any harm because they're really both just 12 volt power or a sensor cable, which is a closed loop circuit with just resistance reading across it. With the rear wheel removed, we're kind of starting to get some test fitting of that rear motor. And there were certain elements of that that needed to be figured out. And it took a lot of pondering, a lot of problem solving. And so this was really just the first stage of that thought process. And much more still was to be decided. And a solution to that we'll kind of show you a little bit later. Here I'm starting to work through a little bit of that battery case placement and I was really limited on all sides, you know, too far forward and I'm going to be crashing into the suspension compression too far back and I'm hitting the rear suspension um, stabilization rod and, you know, too far up, I'm running into the tank, down, not enough ground clearance, so I had to really kind of play with the placement and once I had it in spot, I just went ahead and, you know, tacked on those tubes right there and then was able to finish the welding process of those tubes when I pulled it off. I just wanted to make sure that everything lined up correctly so those rods could be inserted without anything getting caught or binding. Here I'm working on those dropout inserts. I kind of measured the best placement side to side and then found the right elevation, mostly just by measuring with a caliper. And then I cut those dropouts by hand to 230 millimeters um, and just kind of really increment. I cut it too small initially and then incrementally got more towards the correct value. So I wasn't going to cut it too wide just until it barely slipped over. So I modified the rear of that swing arm so that it was able to have it slotted in there correctly with enough space for the nuts to attach. And it actually turned out really well and it's a really snug fit that does the job very well. My thought process behind this was I knew the aluminum that was there would not be sturdy enough and so I made sure to get a nice thick piece of steel. So that is a quarter inch thick steel and I just used the shape of the swing arm as basically boundaries that allow it to form fit and have a nice snug fit to that so that it wouldn't allow it to shift back and forth or side to side. Now here I'm attaching angled braces to the swing arm attachment point that I welded in where the engine mounted previously on the back side there and the goal being to provide basically like a hypotenuse to that triangle so that it can't shift forward or backward as acceleration or deceleration pushes the swing arm forward or backward. 
Now, one of the hardest parts about attaching those steel dropouts to the aluminum swing arm was finding a way for any bolts that went through there, you know, to hold it in place, to not have the aluminum fatigue and eventually wear its way through and get looser and looser. So I took aluminum tubing that was a um, half inch internal diameter and a quarter inch walls, and I actually drilled out one inch diameter holes so that I could fit those inside there and weld them in place, basically as a fixed circular mounting point for the bolts or the threaded rod that I put through there to not cause that to widen the hole over time and keep it perfectly in place. So it was difficult to get them to line up correctly, but I ended up getting it to work correctly, and then I just dropped those little cutouts into the slots that I made and welded them in place with a bolt run through to make sure that there was no misalignment. With all the QS hub motors, there is a little slotted piece of steel that keeps the hub motor in the dropout and prevents it from sliding out the back, and it keeps it aligned correctly. And so with that, you have to have it bolt onto your dropout. So I'm threading a little hole in the right place for that adjustment bar to mount to. And now I'm working on connecting that controller up to the battery power, both positive and negative, and each of the things it runs to prior to connecting to the battery, that being both the contactor on the positive side and the shunt on the negative side. Um, the contactor did have a couple of things I needed to solder to it. I needed to connect a pre-charged resistor, as you can see right there, which allows the capacitors in the controller to stay charged even when it's turned off. So when you turn the switch on, it doesn't have a voltage difference and cause an arc, which wears the contactor out and could cause more dangerous problems. And then I also had to attach a diode in reverse polarity to the contactor to prevent any sort of back voltage um, when you turn the contactor off to keep that safe again. For all the small connections, I ended up using two little manifolds there, and I may add a third um, just to give me plenty of attachment sites for 12 volt positive for the ground and for um, full battery voltage, 102 volt nominal connections. And that allowed me to, in an organized way, transfer, you know, connect multiple things up to the same source without needing to keep tapping additional wires off. And I cut out a slot for the battery charge port, which is just a DC uh, power three pin, much like a computer monitor would have. And we started putting everything together. First we put the motor on and the rear swing arm, and then we test fit the battery and everything associated with the battery because I did not want to put the battery in the case before I knew it was going to work because this was not easy to get on and I knew it would be much more difficult to get out. So it ended up fitting just right with, you know, dry fits, the battery fit just right into the case, and everything was as I hoped it would be, but there's always those nerves leading up to it, you know, you're not quite sure if it's going to fit. Um, I actually ended up short-circuiting that charge port, and so that was a fun experience, but nothing was damaged because the BMS had plenty of discharge. Then I started attaching all the wires for the controller, and that was actually a fairly straightforward process. Everything was clearly labeled, it all paired up very nicely with the throttle that was sent as part of that kit, and there was good documentation provided by the manufacturer for how to use that controller, which I'm referencing on the laptop as I work. I did find a couple other resources that had things written in different ways that were outside of their resources that were helpful, but for the most part you could figure it out with what they did provide, and I, I mean a couple extra tabs that I searched up were pretty helpful for me. Once I got into everything, I realized that it had been pretty effectively programmed from the factory, not quite to the power levels that I was going to end up pulling out of it, but it was pretty well set up and it was a plug and play situation for reverse functions and all those types of things. So they did a really good job from that end. I mean, I just kind of had to work through some of the more fine tuning. And just there you can see me solving one of the problems that I did not expect. I mean, little things like even the kickstand were mounted to the engine previously. And so I had to make a quick adjustment to allow that to mount in the correct position to the foot peg um, mount. And so I ended up getting that sorted and it worked out really well. And I was ready for the first test ride.
And then from there, I moved on to some more of the fine tuning of the controller before I got started, though I took pictures of all the settings as they were, just in case I needed to revert back to those settings at some point. I will do a separate video going through all these programming parameters. I've never seen a hub motor as unbalanced as this one, and balancing a hub motor is not as easy as a normal wheel because they don't spin freely. So I used a modification of a procedure I saw a guy post on the forums with a YouTube channel called DIY Lithium Projects. Uh, he used an idea of runout, which didn't work in my case because the weight imbalance was actually caused by a thicker steel on one side of the wheel than the other, not by an off-centered effect. So instead, I just left it plugged into my programming app, and I put a 100 gram weight on one side of the wheel, and I recorded at what RPM it started to shudder as I spun it up. And after a couple of random placements being marked on that line of tape that I placed, I was able to figure out which direction it needed to go, and ultimately found the correct location for it to sit, and then just messed with the weight, which ended up being about 125 grams. What is up, fellas? I know there was some good narration covering up those time lapse and other videos that I put together, but I wanted to catch you up on all the systems where they currently sit and what is remaining to do. I guess some things that are unique about this that are kind of cool, obviously I employed a new manifold method on the back instead of splitters and letting it get more complicated, which allows us to rethink placements and in a really clean way, how our different voltages and um, polarities represented. So in my first section here, I use these little copper jumpers here. This is my 12 volt positive. These two and these four others are my ground sections. And then this is my 96 volt positive. This connection is actually 96 volt through a switch. And then these three are 96 volt that are unswitched. So these are always under power. The rest of these, this one, and then all of my 12 volt, only are live when you flip that switch. So that switch actually Directly, the power runs directly through that switch. There's no relay here. I had a relay previously. You can see that hole that I tapped out for it to connect. But I did not use it because I ended up finding out that the contactor was 96 volts. But the result of that specifically was I now was not able to use my relay, which was capping out at 40 volts switching um, voltage. So I had to remove that. It turns out about four amps at peak will ever run through this at the highest. And so the switch is more than capable, let alone an actual switch is more than capable of carrying that. So that is uh, an easy solution. DC converters were all wired in. Questions about those, happy to answer. Um, got the phase cables coming up. Those run to the motor, which you've seen plenty of times, but this was actually a labor of love getting those dropouts to work correctly. And they're cinched down tight. It is uh, more than sturdy enough for what this is being subjected to when there's a lot of tension on that nut pushing against that nut. Um, more than sufficient. It's got this obviously little additional plate on the right side that allows it to be held in place forward to backward. Um, and then that little insert is held in place, obviously left to right by those little spacers that I put on. They're welded continuously on the bottom. You can't see that's just tacks on the top. And then there is quarter inch thick tube. This is what's inserted through here. So inserted in to there, butting up against, and then inserted into there, butting up against. And then with a half inch rod, you can see the width of that running through. Um, this is holding it in place, so each one of these is only subject to one-fourth of the motor's power as it moves forward and backward, but the intention is to keep this insert in the correct place. Phase cables I'm going to shorten once we get everything in the correct location. I'll just snip them off, put new ring terminals in the right distance, pull it all forward, take that slack up. And we did have a Custom swing arm attachment, which I know a lot of concerns were floating around. Um, got a 20, got a tube bored out to 26 millimeters. Um, it has the stock Ducati bearings actually in it. I made sure that if you wanted to replace your swing arm bearings on your Ducati, just buy Ducati Monster 750 bearings. That'll be a drop in replacement there. It's got a vertical attachment up to the, what was formerly another rod that ran through the back of the crankcase. I now have a welded on um, just tube that takes place of that. And within that, there's actually another threader rod inserted through that held it in the right place. That's a little bit of additional strength. And then there's an angled tube that runs up to the top. 
Uh, I'm excited to get you guys an update with the tank on once everything's tightened up. To me, I think it's pretty cool seeing all the guts and all the, you know, thinking that goes into putting one of these together and making it lay out in the correct, you know, position so that everything still fits. And man, everything barely fits. That's how you know you've done as much as you possibly can. When you couldn't go higher, you couldn't go lower, you couldn't go more forward or backward, there was just touching something on every side. And so this is as much space as can be used. To the point that I had to actually angle the contactor backward by putting spacers under the front so that the tank, when it came over the top, would not hit here. I had to grind the corners down here so that the tank would not touch there. I mean, you can see how close and then the tank goes between here and there, it is literally touching the tank in the back. Yet I wanted good enough ground clearance that you could sit on it, and then if you went over a speed bump, you're not scraping your battery case up. The space utilization could not have been more effective, and we've got a pretty immense machine put together. That I mean, the flow of this, so freaking cool. When you put the tank on here, that's the only part that's wider than any other part of the bike, like the whole way down. And I mean, that just, I don't know, it looks pretty dang cool. I did gratuitously put a little bit of rubber down on his garage. The one thing I have come to be excited about with this controller is it does not prevent you from inserting higher current values than it is rated to handle. And so I'm actually able to see what it can go to and juice it up a little higher than specs would indicate. They've actually recommended in certain instances manufacturers have that you can use this as a 1000 phase amp controller, not an 800 phase amp controller, just by turning the values up. So I'm gonna be diving into that programming software a lot more tomorrow. And I might take you guys along for the next video as far as what kind of things I had to look through on that programming side of things. Um, it's a whole different world. There are a lot of good resources in this. I ever saw a lot of complaints on like Endless Sphere about APT controllers and bad documentation, programming that didn't work correctly. My experience has been different. I was frustrated last night digging through resources because the folder was cluttered that I was shared, I had shared with me. But as long as you ask QS Motor if you get a, this as part of a kit or whoever you buy it from for resources, it is a guided step-by-step -step process for getting software on the computer and for using that software to build a, a list of parameters and to know what to change. And again, this did come pre-programmed, but it came pre-programmed probably at a lower power than you could get otherwise. Not disappointing, it was very much sufficient, but I'm hoping to see some real good output. Um, obviously, look at the weight distribution of this bike. You're not gonna have a lot of spontaneous wheelies happening just by the fact that there is, if you add in the controller weight, case weight, all the other alt ends, uh, let's say 180 pounds sitting two thirds of the way to the front. However, the rear tire is fat enough with enough contact, hypothetically, when you're sitting on it, to not really get a lot of burnouts. And so, <laughs> it just puts power down. As long as we can get it to program to the way that we would like to see as much power down as possible, um, that's gonna be a good combination. Yeah, realistically, big things left. Attach and program the CT22 module, it's the same module that Zero Motorcycles used from 2014 onward, maybe they ended in the last year or two, but pretty recent. And so that's a whole nother bear, you gotta you know, program it based on tire diameter and things like that to get the correct speed conversion. And then connecting up signals, things like that, and that will be more Inja's job than mine. I'm just gonna make sure he knows which pins are which signals. Um, and that kind of thing so that it's easy just color to color matching and obviously the colors from there do not match the colors as you can clearly see. So I will sign out here. I'm excited to bring you along for the completion and then ultimately we'll have a mad scientist bike that turns into a piece of art. And I know that sometimes the gap between mad scientist and art is large and not visual to those watching. There have been some questions about what's it going to look like when it's all said and done. And I am getting really excited about being able to reveal that and show that. Kind of seeing how it's going to look in my head and knowing where this is going to be at that point. But I'll keep you guys up along the way as we get 
to the other points in the process.